Father, with you. you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us the gift of your holy scriptures for our edification and our challenge. We ask you to bless us today as we consider the freedom offered to, to us in Jesus Christ in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, last week, we began to touch on um, the, the issue of whether, what exactly was Paul asking Philemon to do? Uh, was he asking him to free him uh, uh, or not? Um, and we, we observed, we recalled that the theologians, if they can be called that, during the, oh, come on, where are you? I'm going to quit pushing buttons because every time I do it, something explodes. Um, that the theologians leading uh, in the 1850s, especially when abolitionism was, was very strong in the North and very frightening in the South, when um, the fear of slave revolts in the South was huge. And of course, there had been some uh, brutally uh, suppressed all the time, but but the um, rumor mill about violent slave uprisings was um, was very, very busy in the 1850s and very busy in in the North as well um, for different reasons. The abolitionists came from the North. They're, they had no earring at all in the South. So the letter of Philemon, of course, is is adduced by slaveholders uh, and their apologists to um, to suggest that slavery could be transformed by Christianity into a familial life-giving relationship, um, that a slave was in exactly the same position as a, a wife, a child, um, a father, and, and the slave is simply another member of the household. Um, we, I don't think mentioned, but I can certainly add that um, the difference in size of slave holding people um, and their establishments makes a big difference here because people who didn't have a lot of slaves had them living in their houses. So the idea of a familial uh, relationship made a little bit more sense because um, they were, you know, saw them every day. Um, in, a, in a place where there are 200, 300 slaves in the plantation where the master may never meet some of his slaves. Um, that's a little bit harder to harder harder case to make, um, and so the abolitionists uh, who come from the north and in the only slavery that they had been familiar with, and by the 1850s it kind of doesn't exist in the north, but um, they they did have it. But the kind of slavery they had was uh, 20 or fewer slaves, probably 10 or fewer, probably five or fewer, just not very many people living in the house alongside the people. I came across a, a really cool um, advertisement for somebody <clears throat> who was wanting to sell a slave. And it's in the North, it's in Massachusetts. No, it's in New York. And he wants to sell a female slave and it sells like two of her children. And the reason he needs to sell her is because she is such a good breeder. Now, of course, in the South, that's great. You you want a good breeder, and you know the more the merrier. That's really great, and probably some of them are going to be the master's children or the overseer's children or a bunch of them. So, but in the north, when these people have to live in your house, um, you the idea of their reproductivity is uh, it's a problem. It's not a gift, and it certainly influences the absence of the trade in the north. Um, though, as we as we know from recent lawsuits. Um, the trade uh, may not have been active in the North, but the benefit from it was, was certainly in the North, and that's for sure. So the letter, um, a lot hinges on whether um, Paul is asking Philemon to free Onesimus or not. And we can... He talks about 
here's what he says. You've probably got the letter with you. That you might have him back forever, he says in verse 15, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave. As a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Here comes the IOU. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Um, okay, so I think I might have been Ren last week uh, was, was saying, you know, yeah, we, we want this to mean that Onesimus, that uh, Philemon should free Onesimus, but um, uh, Ren didn't think it stood up. Um, now, the Macaulay, who has written, he's the one who wrote um, Reading Wild Black that I've been leaning on a lot, um, suggests that it is impossible for um, the slave relationship to be transformed in such a way that uh, that that something familial could could replace the slave relationship, yet the ownership of the person would remain untouched. And um, and that's what I want I want us to discuss today. Uh, is 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 that the case? When he talks about I want you to do uh, more. What is more? Receive him more than a slave as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you? Here is um, some, some black uh, theologians and thinkers, the public intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois. And, you know, yes, we do know that it's Du Bois, but he said Du Bois. And I think it is... Um, it is polite to call people as they call themselves. So he's the boys to me. Um, well, let, let me not do that. Let me start with Frederick Douglass instead because he precedes him. Um, Frederick Douglass says, and he's in the 50s, in the United States, men have interpreted the Bible against liberty. They have declared that the Bible sanctions slavery. What do we do in such a case? What do you do when you are told by the slaveholders of America that the Bible sanctions slavery? Do you go and throw your Bible into the fire? Do you sing out no union with the Bible? Do you declare that a thing is bad because it has been misused, abused, and made bad use of? Do you throw it away on that account? No. You press it to your bosom all the more closely. And you read it all the more diligently and prove from its pages that it is on the side of liberty and not of slavery. So we have two, um, two different ways of looking at what scripture can do for us. Um, the slaveholders think that it um, allows you to transform the master-slave relationship into something holy. And um, someone like Douglas says, you know, that's just impossible. Um, in Massachusetts, in the end of the 18th century, there was, um, there was a group of black people who petitioned, um, pe petitioned the government, the, legislature to um to to end their bondage um and they and this is fully 100 years before it's about it's 18 uh, 1774 so it's almost 100 years before douglas is writing how can we offer obedience freely if it is compelled is what they're saying our children are taken from us by force and sent many miles from us, where we seldom or never see them again. They are to be made slaves for life, which sometimes is very short, by reason of being dragged from their mother's breast. 
Our lives are embittered to us on these accounts. By our deplorable situations, we are rendered incapable of showing our obedience to Almighty God. How can a slave perform the duties of a husband to a wife or parent to his child? How can a husband leave master and work and cleave to his wife? How can the wife submit themselves to their husbands in all things? And here he's quoting from Ephesians. How can a child obey their parents in all things? There is a great number of us sincere members of the Church of Christ. How can the master and the slave be said to fulfill that command? Live in love. Let brotherly love continue and abound. So he's quoting Paul freely from several letters, um, making the argument. And this is in the 18th century. And it's in the north, not in the south that the compulsion under which a slave lives makes his further duty to God uh, moot. He, it doesn't matter what, his, what he does because his, his, his autonomy is not his own to give. So let's move to um, what Douglas has said that we just heard. And um, an, an address, his point, um, and the point of the people writing 100 years before him, a group of freed Black people or enslaved Black people who knew enough, they knew how to write, they knew how to read, they knew who to petition. They were not, um, they weren't field hands. They were people who lived in the North, probably in the homes, of the people whom they served. And so they, they, their, their situation was different from the ones in the South, but, um, but they were not free. And I'm wondering how their plea, um, how it works for you. And do you agree with Douglas that it would be impossible for a master and a slave to attain the brotherly relationship that Paul asks or, um, or not? Let's. Um, Everybody unmute yourself and. All right. Should I go ahead and stop the recording now? Yeah, I think so. <laughs>